going to record start recording here all right well fa- all right well first of all tonight i'm going to talk about rf exposure how to evaluate your station and a lot of the material that i'm presenting was derived from material published by the owner of hamradioschool.com who i know from when i lived in colorado years ago and feel free to interrupt me because I'm not afraid to ask questions during your briefings. And if I know the answer, I'll give you a good answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll get back to you. So, let's see. You, you may just try to do a page down. Show at the top there, Ed. Pardon me? Slideshow in the top menu, it's sort of to the right. Under view? Nope. Keep going. There's a thing that says slideshow. Let me On see. that same line next to view, it's just further right down. Okay, view. No, no, I mean, keep, just keep going on that line. Here? Just a moment here. I'll, uh, I'm Go requesting to... remote control just to show you I can. Okay, good. Okay. It's over, over to the right, Ed. So, Ed, what you want is slideshow right there, and we'll start from the first slide. Okay. And then I, I will just hit page down. Right. All right. And now I'm going to uh, give up remote control. It's all yours. All right. These are the Federal Communications Commission that I just call Federal Candy Company regulations. The requirement to conduct an RF radio frequency exposure evaluation is described in FCC regulations so and so, and it includes a table of all the ham bands with transmit power levels in watts for each band. An RF environmental evaluation must be performed if your power into your antenna exert exceeds the limits for the band of operation uh, expressed in peak envelope power. So for example, if we'll say my favorite band is 20 meters, Let's assume you were running 500 watts and you had a 3 dB loss, pretty poor quality coax in a long run. So that would be a 3 dB loss. In that case, you would have 250 watts into your antenna. Well, that's more than 225 watts. So you would have to do an RF safety evaluation, which we're going to discuss over the next few pages. Let's say on 40 meters, another one of my favorite bands, I could run up to 500 watts. My coax actually is about a dB and a half loss. So just doing the math in my head, I could run about 700 watts out of my transmitter. And due to the coax loss, I would probably be slightly under 500 watts. So if that was truly the case, I would not have to do an RF study. And you notice the amount of watts varies with frequency, and I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. So if an evaluation, here's how you t- could tell if an evaluation is required. Determine the maximum power output of your transmitter for a particular band in units of power, peak envelope power watts, Determine the power loss in decibels of your transmission line. And that's a function of just looking it up in a table. For example, for my coax, it might be a half a dB per 100 feet at 80 meters and 3 dB per 100 feet for 2 meters. Then you have to calculate the resulting maximum power input to the antenna due to the coax loss and then compare the power into your antenna with the FCC table. And if you, ex- if you don't exceed it, time to just relax. If you do exceed it, we have to turn to the FCC Office of Engineering Technical Bulletin 65, which has a boring title, Evaluating Compliance with FCC Guidelines for human exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields. And 
the FCC bulletin has three methods, which I'm going to show you now. The first method is very simple. It's just calculation. We'll use a spreadsheet. The second is by calculation based on computer modeling. It's a bit more complicated. The third method is measurements of field strength using calibrated equipment. This is very expensive. And even in my career, working for the several wealthy government agencies, HI, we could not afford to have our test equipment calibrated all the time. Now, the human body absorbs RF energy with variable efficiency based upon frequency. RF energy is non-ionizing radiation, meaning it heats up the body tissues and can cause health hazards if the exposure level is too great. Oh, let me back up. It's not ionizing radiation such as you get from a CAT scan or an X-ray, but it's still potentially dangerous. The FCC bulletin specifies the maximum power density expressed in milliwatts per centimeter squared. A milliwatt is one thousandth of a watt. And the FCC has two values. One is called occupational controlled space. So that would be, you know, a radar technician as a, or a ham radio operator, someone who is supposed to be familiar with the terminology and good practices. And then a lower maximum power exposure for the general public. So that would apply to your family members, neighbors, other hams visiting you. So we're going to talk about the two levels. So for example, just looking at this chart at about 10 meters, I'm over here. The maximum power exposure is one milliwatt per centimeter squared for us hams, but then for our neighbors and children, it's five times more stringent or a 0.2 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So when we do the evaluation, depending upon the distance and the power, it's very possible that we'll meet the exposure limit for our ham shack but let's say for our children's bedroom, we have we are faced with a, a more stringent limit and their bedroom is closer to our transmitting antennas. So it's very possible you can meet it for one criteria, but not the other criteria. So these are the factors expect that impact exposure. Again, the average power at your antenna accounting for your coax loss duty cycle. So FM, the duty cycle is one. Morse code, dots and dashes, the duty cycle might be 50%. And for single sideband, the duty cycle might be closer to 70%, as well as the average transmit time over 30 minutes. Also your antenna gain, reference to an isotropic source, Again, your operating frequency and power falls off as one over four pi r squared. So your distance to the, the distance, for example, from your shack, from your antenna to your neighbor's house or your antenna to a child playing in your backyard or from your antenna to yourself inside your shack. That's why the distance to area of importance is a very key factor when we run through the math. So again, let's say for a frequency of 28 megahertz or 10 meters, the maximum power exposure is one milliwatt per centimeter squared for the controlled space, meaning the ham. And for uncontrolled space, such as a child sleeping upstairs, a neighbor's child outside, the maximum power maximum permissible exposure is 0.2 milliwatts per centimeter squared. 
So in a few minutes, I'm gonna show you, we would calculate the distance from our antenna to our station, and also from our antenna to our child's bedroom. I'm just using an example, using the same formula, but with a di different distance to see if we're compliant. It's very possible we may be compliant for our shack, but not for the bedroom. Or vice versa, our shack might be on a, in an attic, and a child's bedroom might be in the basement. So now, let's see, John, I might need your help again. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share, John, Yeah. how do I share the screen? Okay, I gotta share the screen again. Okay, well, no, actually, uh, Ed, you still are sharing the screen. The, the question is that uh, when you picked the thing that you were sharing, did you tell it to share the desktop or did you tell it to share this application? I think it's, I don't remember. This is a, on my desktop, it's a spreadsheet. Okay, then let's uh, tell you what do is just, uh, just for a second, uh, stop screen sharing and then uh, screen share again. And when it shows you the little screen, select the one that shows the spreadsheet. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to, Laura is going to fire me from presentations. Okay, I have to figure out how to get down there. Uh, first of all, you just have to go up to the top and tell it to to stop screen sharing. I can do it for you if you want. Okay, please okay. do. Okay. We're going to go back to my first uh, slideshow in a, at the, in about five yeah. minutes. So just go ahead and hit share screen, and now you can share your spreadsheet. Okay. So now we're going to. This is a little spreadsheet that Ham Radio School came up with. They actually made some modifications. So let's use this. You just plug in the numbers and it uses the formula. And basically, in this case, we said 1,000 watts, 50 feet of coax, and the coax loss for this frequency was seven tenths of a dB per hundred feet. The operating mode was single sideband. By changing modes, we're changing duty cycle. He, he's assuming, you know, 60% of the time in a 30 minute period we're transmitting. And we used an operating frequency of 14.25, kind of the center of 20 meters phone. And it calculated the average power into the antenna is 110 watts. The antenna gain is 6.3 dBi. That would be typical of a small tri-band beam. And in this case, we'll say the distance to the area of interest is 20 feet. So we're saying from your antenna to your maybe uh, attic shack, We'll just say it's 20 feet. So for a controlled environment, the power density is essentially a tenth of a milliwatt per centimeter square, significantly below one milliwatt per centimeter square. So we're compliant. And we're also compliant for, let's see. I didn't go into this, but if you want to worst case it, you can include your power density with a 100% reflection off the ground. We're still compliant. But let's now change this a little bit. Let's say we're running 1500 watts. And let's say our coax, our coax is only 25 feet. And let's say we have more antenna gain, like Jim Owen has. I'm just exaggerating, say 9 dB. Well, for this case, we're still compliant. So let's go back to my other briefing and see the big picture again. But again, this is a table. John's gonna, and I will post my briefing where I could email it to people. And you could feel free to use this little online spreadsheet 
and play games with different situations. Oh, I know what we'll do. Let's see. We'll, we'll even change frequencies. So let's do it for 52 megahertz, six meter band. Again, we're still compliant. But I ran a bunch of cases beforehand where we were not compliant. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to try two meters. Yeah, I was just going to say, Ed, you're not you're not compliant now for the uncontrolled. Okay, well, let me go. What was that for? Fifty-two megahertz. Yes, yeah, well, if you scroll down, yeah, it, it was. Okay, so. good, good, good. For the uncontrolled, we're not. Well, that's the example I was trying to get to. So we're compliant. To our, we're compliant to our shack if it's only 20 feet. But if we had a child sleeping or a neighbor's child 20 feet away, we're non-compliant. Yeah. So that was the example I was trying to show you could be compliant for one and not compliant for the other. Can I have a question? Sure. Uh, when did these rules become in effect? Joe, for many, I believe about 10 years ago, there's a, a recent change that I didn't make part of my briefing because it affects mainly 900 megahertz and above. But Jim Owen, do you agree with me? Maybe about 2010 or so? Yeah, he's shaking his head, but I think that was a yes. Yes. Joe, roughly. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay, it, roughly ten or twelve years ago. I think it was more than that. Okay. Because I've been here twelve years, and when I was in Maryland, I had to do it. So I'd say okay. it's more like eighteen, maybe even as much as twenty years ago. So you're saying maybe the year two thousand. Yeah, or before even. It's been a good while. Okay. Any other questions? All right, now, John, let's see if I could get, now we get, get back to share screen. Uh, actually, Ed, I'm, I'm going to unshare your screen and then you can share it again. Okay. Thank you. So these are the steps to mitigate the possibility of exceeding the maximum exposure limits relocate or elevate your antenna. Well, guess what? Jim Owen and I and others are always advocating, get your antenna up as high as possible because the higher you get it up in general, the better your performance. And it also improves RF safety. It reduces the likelihood that you'll expose anyone to RF limits that exceed the FCC requirement. You can restrict your pointing antenna directions. In other words, you might be forced to face your antenna to the west when you're operating certain bands, certain modes, and certain power limits if you can exceed the limit, limit by pointing it to your neighbor's house in the southerly direction. You might have to restrict bands as you see certain frequencies have more stringent limits. Restrict your mode use. So FM, for example, is a very high duty cycle. Another big factor is to reduce your power into your antenna. But although I have two alpha amplifiers, about 80% of the time, I don't run my amplifiers because it's always good amateur operating practice to run the minimum power required. So if you if you do some of these things like elevate your antenna and run the minimum power, I'm sure you won't have to restrict your station operation times. So again, the, the big points I wanted to mention is since power falls off as one over four pi R squared, keep your antenna as high as possible. You'll work more DX that way anyway, and reduce your power. Yeah, I just got my, Dominion bill, and I'm certainly not going to be running my amplifier unless I have to. Jim, you, you're raising your hand. Go, please take it away. 
Oh, he he wasn't. He's scratchy. Okay. I got on you. Now I was just fixing to check into the Virginia phone net. Well, thank you very much for clarifying the regs. So that that's my presentation, and I try to keep it to under twenty minutes. But we have at least ten minutes for questions. Nope, we don't request again. Ed, between, go ahead. Questions? Yes, Bill. Okay. Uh, now that this may be uh, I'm not not trying to uh, get around it here, but if I look, you've got uh, about what seven different factors here to change the parameters going into the calculations, right? Yes. So if you look at the permutations and combinations of that, I mean, you're talking about seven factorial or something like that. It almost sounds like you'd have to have, if you were operating, for example, in a, uh, in a contest, in order to be safe, you'd have to, to eliminate some directions or frequencies or something pretty severely and keep track of that or modify it as you go. It just seems very uh, difficult to do that without some kind of equipment, which you say we can't afford. <laughs> am, I, am I asking a stupid no, question? No, your question is an excellent question. And I, that was a factor, for example, when I relocated to Charlotte, so I'm on seven acres my nearest neighbor is 700 feet away. So I have that factor. I don't have any little kids other than an occasional granddaughter running around my backyard and I'm usually chasing her, I'm not in the air. But yes, but the biggest factor is, you know, just if you, ra if you ran the math, like if you ran the math, you, I think it's gonna turn out 90% of the time you could run 1500 watts as long as your antenna is up 60, 70 feet usually get by and 15 and 10 meters are a little bit more difficult because the limits are more stringent but for 80 and 40 as you saw I forgot what the limits are but there's something like let's go see so for example you go from one milliwatt per centimeter squared for your own exposure up to 100 milliwatts per centimeters squared at about 80 meters. So you're right, by ju you, you might have to do the cal, typically you really have to do the calculation once per band and your antenna gain should be the same when you rotate your antenna or if you have a vertical antenna. And remember, I used an absurd example of 9 dB. Most of us don't have antennas. I don't have an antenna. My antenna is more like 6 or 7 dB gain. And it's a pretty large Yagi. I'm, I'm just trying to figure how it would practically ensure the safety. And it, all right, so I, you know, I run a maximum of 300 watts in the apartment here. Um, I've got no loss, no coax loss to the antenna. It's only five feet long. And uh, some of the other things, there are no kids around. And I guess I could, I could come up with a worst case situation considering uh, people in the shack or one of the things that I could call constant and uh, come up with some kind of a ballpark operation zone that would be uh, clearly safe. I, that's the only practical way I could, I think I could. No, you, yeah, you, you could maybe do it something like this. Once per band and, and calculate the distance from your antenna to you, and then once per band and calculate the distance from your antenna to your kitchen where you might have people congregating. Yeah. Yeah. But you raised a good point. I, I did it for once per band. 
And, and I was going to suggest also that the issue of, uh, of what percentage of the time you're transmitting, because all of this stuff is averaged over that 30 minute period. Right. So if you're only transmitting 20% of the time, then that exposure drops. You yes. Would, and the other yeah. thing also is that the different things in terms of their duty cycle, uh, you know, if you're doing FM, well, the transmitter is putting out full power all the time. But if you're doing uh, SSB, I think I saw on the bottom of your spreadsheet there that that's only you doing 20%. I don't remember if it was a 20 or 70%. I, I think the I think, digital mode. Yeah, I, I think on your spreadsheet it showed, uh, it showed, uh, it was a little bit at the bottom below where you you're were. Right, you're right. You're right. It's also, for example, I don't know about you, but let's say I was on the air from 9 a.m. till. 11 a.m. 90 percent of it was listening tuning around the band lit, eavesdropping. Yeah. maybe 10 percent of it was actually transmitting it, it it sounds like the risk level well for me in this situation right now i'm just you know looking at the possibilities uh would be would be pretty <laughs> pretty small and uh, if you were guessing at some of these things, uh, or coming close at least. Now, how is this? Uh, how is this enforced? It's is it, not. Uh, is it up to me? And I, that, you know, yes, I it's pretty that much on I the have. honor system. It's the honor system, yeah. But For I, example. But yeah, what I'm getting at is that, you know, if there was somebody challenged that, uh, I mean, it would, I would get safe enough to where I, I certainly could know more about the situation than they did, no matter how yes. they did that. For example, though, when I was involved in the deployment of the National Network of Doppler Weather Radars, known as NEXRAD, we would have these citizens groups complain about RF radiation zapping their children and causing brain cancer. And we would do very, very sophisticated analysis and show them that we are operating many orders of magnitude yeah. below the leakage from a microwave oven. Even though Nextrad runs 1.9 megawatts peak power, it's, it's a pulse rate or it's duty cycle is like 0 0.00021. I probably am off, but something like that. And the real issue was the neighbors didn't care about RF safety. They cared about this big ass radar antenna adversely impacting property values. Right. right. And there was lots of court cases. I got thrown out of a town hall meeting by a drunk person named Larry Haggard who was really worried about property values. He was the actor from Dallas. But, you know, it'd be interesting, maybe tomorrow you and I could get on the phone, Bill. I'd be curious to just do the calculation with you for your operating power and see what you come up with. And John's right. The transmit on time, that point, that 60% value that I chose was maybe way too conservative. I think that was your point, John, right? Yep, yep nope, that was, a, that was a, absolutely the point there. Uh, the, uh, the, the perfect case study of, of, of some people that were not obeying the uh, maximum permissible exposure units were the uh, radar operators in World War II that when it was cold out, they used to go stand in front of their radars in order to warm up. And uh, the problem was it tended to congeal the fluids inside their eyes. So <laughs> I recommend against going out and standing by your dipole to warm yourself up. Yes. And remember, I mean, you were basically, what you're concerned about here is actually a heating effect. It's, heating it really effect. is a heating effect that's going yeah. on there. Yeah. Yes, and long-term cellular damage. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Well, you, I'm really glad you asked those questions, Bill, because you raised some great points. Any other questions? All right, well, I guess I'm done sharing the screen. Thanks very much. But keep the questions going. Because if I have to think to answer a question, that's good.
Larry, do you have any additional? Uh, Carolina Wyndham, Montana. So this sounds like something I wouldn't need to worry about. Seems like it's more for but, people. You know, Joe, asked. the question you should have asked was, if you stip, say 100 watts and a certain frequency. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's like 100 watts on 10 meters could be an issue conceivably. 100 watts on 10 meters. Okay, it's if you get 50 watts into your antenna. So if you ran 100 watts and your coax loss was less than 3 dB, in theory, you'd, you'd still have to do the analysis. I suspect you would do the analysis and you'd be problem free. Yeah, I guess one problem with wire antennas, like a Carolina Wyndham at 10 meters, it probably has a very strange pattern <laughs> of radiation. So, so that'd yeah. be hard to figure out. Yeah, you would just pick the worst case for the analysis in terms of the game. But, you know, how many feet of coax do you run? Oh, maybe like, oh, 70 feet. Is it like RG8X or the larger LMR 400 half inch coax? Uh, it's like RG8. Yeah, you'd probably, you know, I'm guessing on 10 meters, that's about a dB and a quarter dB and a half. So in theory, you'd have more than 50 watts into the antenna due to coax loss <laughs> on 10 meters. So you'd have to do the analysis, but I had a feeling if you did the analysis, you'd be okay. Yeah, because I think with a wire antenna, it's still probably pretty, pretty unlikely. Right. I, I can pretty much say if you're up 30 feet, even if you're right under it, you're well under the specs. Yeah. Right, even if your neighbors were practically under your antenna. I think mm -hmm. in Maryland, I figured uh, on 10 meters running a kilowatt, uh, 30 feet away, I was in in uh, alliance with it. Yeah. yeah, I remember once I lived in an apartment and there were no antennas allowed, so I just ran wires all along the ceiling. <laughs> might have been out of- Now that might be a little bit iffy. But maybe on 80 meters it wouldn't be problem. Jim, what type of antenna did you have at your Maryland QTH? Four element, Yagi. Oh, okay. So you had 7 at, dB gain. At 40 feet, I had a four element Yagi. Okay. The neighbors were about 150 feet away. Again, have your antenna as high as possible. You'll work yep. out better. And no need to run a kilowatt all the time. Yep. The, the, the inverse square law is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Yes, right. when it comes when it comes to radiation like this. The, the you know every every little bit you get away, it drops by a square. Yes. Uh, how is that thirty minute? You said it's measured on a thirty minute basis, right? So, it, it's right. It's time limited. Okay, but for some of us, you know, and especially us old retired farts, we we come in here when we get a chance and maybe operate for 10 minutes or something like that. And then we don't come back for another hour or whatever. You'd have a hard time, I think, uh, winding up with any kind of useful. But you're well under no, the it would, that would be a very honest, you would say of 30 minutes, you operated for 10 minutes and maybe of that 10 minutes, only five minutes was transmit time. Right. So it'd be five over 30. That would be a very honest analysis. Yeah. You'd be well under the spec. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not too worried. E even at full 1500 watts, unless your antenna is 10 feet above the ground, you're right. within specs. And notice if you First operate eight, 80 and 40, which a lot of people operate, the limits are much higher. As I remember years ago when I calculated it on 80 meters running a kilowatt, uh, you couldn't be closer than four feet from the antenna. Right. Be within. Very, that, I so. personally only know one ham was a beam for 80 meters. Yeah, I only knew one too. Okay, well, 
I hope everyone learned a little bit tonight. I learned a lot from your excellent questions. Larry, before we, do you have any words before we wrap up? 